uh, dear friends and the uh, uh, distinguished speakers, okay. uh, you are welcome uh, to celebrate uh, World Anthropology Day. So, uh, warm greetings to you all. And I request our president uh, of Anthropological Association for Humankind, Professor Naren Redigaru, to chair this meeting. And uh, yeah, please. Most welcome to the distinguished speakers and the other my colleagues. Today is a World Anthropology Day. In this context, AAH is the first time conducting the distinguished lectures with the two dis distinguished speakers. Uh, one is Dr. Bart and another is uh, Abhijit Gohaji and the most distinguished speakers of the world. We are very happy to welcome you, sir, on this August occasion. And the theme is Anthropological Contributions for Human Well-Being in a Culturally Pluralistic World. And we are very happy that uh, we are celebrating this World Anthropology Day under the auspices of Anthropological Association for Humankind. The Anthropological Association for Humankind extends a warm invitation to our upcoming Distinguished Lectures, a series dedicated to illuminating the latest and most impactful insights in the field of anthropology. Esteemed scholars, practitioners, and thought leaders will grace the platform to share the profound experiences, research, and perspectives, offering a unique opportunity to delve into the depths of anthropological knowledge. Anthropology as the study of humankind holds a unique position in unraveling the complexities of our culturally pluralistic world. On the occasion of the World Anthropology Day, we convene to explore and celebrate the profound contributions of anthropology to human well-being within the diverse cultural landscapes. In a world marked by cultural diversity, anthropologists play a pivotal role in displaying intricate a tapestry of traditions, beliefs, and practices that shape human societies. This celebration acknowledges the importance of cultural pluralism and the role anthropologists play in promoting the mutual understanding and respect. Anthropology contributes to social cohesion by recognizing and valuing differences. By understanding the needs of various cultures, anthropologists foster inclusive environments that transcend social divisions, promoting a sense of belonging and shared human humanity. Cultural contexts significantly impact health practices and well-being. Anthropologists provide insights into culturally sensitive health care, addressing local beliefs and practices. The celebration delves into the ways of anthropology contributes to improved health outcomes and holistic well-being. Today, we have two distinguished lectures. The one lecture is uh, the, the world-famous Dr. Bartholomew C. Dean, a famous American anthropologist uh, who gives the end of the future trauma, memory, and reconciliation in Peruvian Amazon. This is the first lecture by Dr. Bartholomew C. Dean. And the second lecture is uh, Nation Building in Indian Anthropology by Professor Abhijit Goha. So once again, I welcome the, the, these two distinguished speakers to deliver the uh, two important lectures uh, in the context of World Anthropology Day. Uh, I also welcome uh, the executive committee members, uh, the distinguished um, uh, audience, and other anthropologists to this occasion. Thank you. Thank you, dear president. Um, uh, I'm, I'm Dr. Pedrata Ekade, General Secretary of Anthropological Association for Humankind. I, I, I just want to introduce our distinguished uh, speaker, uh, Professor Bartholomew Crispin Dean. Uh, I just uh, uh, read a few lines about his about him. 
in the uh, in his book recently he authored a book called the end of the future uh, trauma memory and reconciliation in peruvian amazonia so that uh, that is the topic of this uh, session of his session also so in the end of the future author bartolomeo dean broadens the theoretical framework for understanding memories role in reconciliation following a violent conflict this book explores the complicated and uh, confusing linkages uh, uh, between memory and trauma for individuals caught up in civil war and a post conflict reconciliation in the peruvian amazonia amazon's haulaga uh, uh, valley an epicenter for leftist uh, rebels and a booming shadow economy based on the extraction and uh, circulation of cocaine the end of the future tells the story of violent attempts by the uh, tupac amaru uh, revolutionary movement <clears throat> um, to uh, to overthrow the uh, state in the late 1980s and early 1990s from the perspective of the poorest residents of the lower haluga um kenarichi basin to give this uh, context uh, to the cause of uh, consequences of the um, mrts uh, presence in the lower and central haluga this book relies on the written works and testimony of um, Uh, sister gracia torres and uh, mrta rebel commander the government's uh, tr truth and reconciliation commission mrta uh, propaganda media accounts and uh, critical historical texts besides exposing haluga valley human rights abuses the book's con contribution to political anthropology is uh, consequential for its uh, insistence that reconciliation okay. is by no means equivalent to local and uh, uh, <clears throat> indigenous options uh, of justice or customary forms of uh, dispute uh, resolution without deliberately addressing the di diverse socio cultural contours uh, defining uh, overlapping epistemologies of justice freedom and uh, communal uh, well being enduring reconciliation will likely remain elusive about the speaker director of uh, professor uh, um, bartolomeo crispin dean is the director of uh, public anthropology programs at the uh, university of kansas institute for uh, policy and social research uh, he is an associate professor in the department of anthropology at the university of kansas he is the founding vice president of anthropological association for human kind dean is uh, a research associate of KU's laboratory of biological anthropology as well as a research affiliate at the uh, universidad uh, nicolau de san martin uh, tarapota uh, peru and a contributing editor for lowland south america library of congress dean is the author of the state and the um, amazon uh, frontier expansion in the upper amazon 1541 to 1990 urania urerina society and cosmology and uh, history in peruvian amazonia and co-editor of uh, at the risk of being heard identity indigenous rights and um, uh, post colonial states he has just uh, uh, completed the book uh, the end of the future trauma memory and reconciliation in peruvian amazonia so on this uh, topic uh, he will be delivering his lecture so i requ i now request uh, professor uh, dean uh, to deliver his lecture thank you sir uh thank you dr gade thank you president uh, and 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 dr uh um, ready for very kind words thank my uh, co speaker as well and particularly all of the uh, uh the guests anthropologists colleagues Um Dr. Gade, would you be able to enable me to share the screen? For some reason, I'm not able to do that right now. It says um the participant screen sharing has been disabled. Is that possible?
Yeah, yeah. Please, please go ahead, sir. Uh, now it is. Okay. I think it should work now. Hopefully. Got all this. Shift over. Uh, th thanks again. And what I'm going to do uh, today is um, uh, give background on a very traumatic aspect of Peruvian history. I'm making the assumption that um, nobody in the audience knows anything about this part of the world, and I could be completely wrong. So pardon me. Um, I have quite a lot of material, and I uh, know that I have a limited amount of time. So I'll try to go fairly quickly on some of the historical information and um, emphasize the latter part, which is really looking at the issue of inner voice, uh, the conversations that we have with ourselves that help shape our own social identity, uh, our behavior. And as an anthropologist who spent a very many uh, months, years collecting personal narratives, one notes the importance of inner voice. So the group that I'm, I'm going to be talking about is the MRTA, which um, I'll mention why they are called that. And uh, thank you, Dr. Gade, for trying to, uh, to say the term Wayaga, which is a very uh, difficult word. But the region, the word, um, represents a river, which is very, very important, and it flows directly into the Amazon. Um, and really, this is about a period of time roughly 1980 to the early 2000s, which um, I've categorized and others as an internal war. We could have debates about what a civil war is not and isn't. But it was a time certainly um, of, of ethnic, of, of uh, ideological, um, of all sorts of, of, of problems. Um, the two major groups when we talk about leftists, and some of you may have heard much more about the shining path, which is Sendero Luminoso. Um, and the MRTA, uh, like uh, the, the shining path, um, uh, their efforts during this time was to overthrow the government. During Peru's post-colonial history, roughly the 1820s until that time, this was the most significant uh, uh, war uh, well over 70,000 individuals died, uh, about half a million um, people displaced. And we certainly do not know the numbers in the region I work in, which represents about 60% of the national territory. Um, the ideology uh, associated certainly with Marxist-Leninist um, and I mentioned Tupac Amaro, and they take the name after Tucumaro II, an indigenous resistance fighter um, against the Spanish. Um, here we see imagery of Tupac Amaro II. Uh, he was an 18th century revolutionary, led Andean uprising, was almost successful. Um, uh, he's certainly uh, been used uh, strategically um, in a symbolic fa a fashion in, 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 in many aspects, I think, of the creation of what it is to be a Peruvian or Peruvian nationhood. As I mentioned before, uh, uh, strong influence Marxism, Leninism, strong dose of Peruvian nationalism, advocacy of the rights of the oppressed indigenous communities, and fundamental belief in armed struggle to achieve a socialist state. During this time, certainly the emergence, Peru was going through profound economic instability, social inequality was increasing, political corruption 
this all helped fuel certainly the rise of insurgent groups like the MRT in particular. Um, and this corresponds with, I think, neoliberalism throughout much of Latin America, um, associated with hyperinflation, government austerity, and increased, uh, direct increased human rights violations. Coming back to the Wyaga Valley, those who can see this, there's a region that, that, that starts in the Andes and then goes all the way into the lower Amazon. It became uh, transformed, certainly, for a series of really novel cultural encounters, profound conflicts, um, and the MRTA's presence in this region, I think, um, exacerbated all of this. It's a lush rainforest region, remote um, in terms of infrastructure, largely underdeveloped, became strategic uh, operational base, the primary base for this group, MRTA. Um, uh, Dr. Gade had mentioned uh, 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 cocaine. The Wyaga Valley, for those who can see it, uh, to the right, there's a map of portion of Peru. Um, the big green splotch right there is, is the Wyaga one of the central producers of, of, of coca leaves, which you see to the left, which has nothing to do with cocaine. It's the, the derivative, or you, you use it um, and then put a variety of chemicals to process it. But the point here is it became a major center for the production of, of coca. And uh, the, uh, the rebels certainly uh, took to their advantage on the likes of Che Guevara, the challenging terrain which offered a natural advantage for their warfare tactics. Um, they, in the outset, I think, the early, maybe the half of the movement, made uh, uh, successful strategic alliances, uh, attracted disenfranchised individuals. So by the mid-1980s, they had a significant base, not just in the rural zones, but in urban, semi-peri-urban regions. Um, their actions uh, certainly span from propaganda, distribution of armed, uh, uh, or not, or me, not armed, well, uh, uh, arms that they captured, but armed assaults, um, kidnappings, um, charging of war taxes called cupos. Um, and certainly we see this corresponding to, you know, widespread social banditry phenomenon that's been well documented, I think, in anthropological, historical, sociological uh, literature. See groups taking up arms in response to generalized social injustice, and the 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 effort to gain a measure a degree of of local support in this uh, this region a tremendous amount of local support actually. When we look at the organizational structure, quite hierarchical, central leadership, uh, decentralized cell zones operated semi autonomous. Um, we see, you know, a, a transformation of, I think, classic Marxist Lenin's organizational principles to the context of, of, of Peru. Quite flexible, adaptable in their in their operations, uh, in terms of their cell structure, um, and their reliance on local operations and um, thorough engagement with the community. Um, so we see use of, of so-called classic guerrilla. Uh, Guevara's uh, uh, tactics, sabotage, ambush, his selective targeting of, of infrastructure personnel, and and their efforts were really to weaken, uh, to to demonstrate the visibility of of the revolution. Um, overall, their efforts were to disrupt daily life, certainly for the state, and to expand control over their territories. And it was a mix, certainly, I think, of, a, of, 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 of revolutionary theory, but also of just basic practical considerations of very rough uh, of terrain, and not to mention the, the fractured political landscape of the time. Um, their, their activities went beyond military, engaged in, in massive political propaganda to build popular support. Keep in mind, in this region, le uh, levels of literacy are very, very low, despite the fact that there were uh, pamphlets, but m m m uh, many uh, uh, participatory communal assemblies held. Um, number of key figures, I'll just mention one in particular, very, very important, Victor Poloy Campos, one of the founders, um, uh, ideological visionary, certainly helped uh, the, the shape MRTA's decision. 
Um, and he tried to balance, I think, political a uh, actions with military, unlike uh, w one would argue the Shining Path, Senator Luminoso, um, which was primarily the military. Um, a, a very charismatic individual, um, as well as, you know, his enemy, uh, Abimal Guzman. When we look at the impact on the local populace, is one of my great concerns is and if those who can see on this slide, I'm highlighting the dual nature of the insurgent governance. Very complex. On one level, we see the provision of social services that the government, the state was incapable, unwilling to do, garnering you know, tremendous local support. On the other hand, uh, widespread coercion, violence, extortion, fear, uh, assassinations. Um, so some supported the MRTA's goals. I have many accounts. Others did not. They suffered from these violent tactics, extortion schemes. Eventually, I think the group uh, led to the militarization of everyday life in these affected areas, which... Um, then I, uh, I keep on coming back to the to the shining path. Keep in mind these are vital enemies. They fought it out over the territory. Um, the MRTA, I would say, uh, um, uh, less radical um, in comparison to shining paths, uh, Maoist um, ideology, um, um, less much less uh, moderate, and we can see this reflected in the number of, I think, uh, victims. The government's response, I think, um, not surprisingly, to the insurgency um, at the outset was a mix of, of military action, efforts at social reform, but they were simply unprepared for the scale of the conflict. They were overwhelmed. Um, and in response, this led to a, to a rapid escalation of counterinsurgency efforts with the assistance of the United States government. Um, widespread, certainly, accusations of human rights abuses, documentation of extrajudicial killings. The Wag Valley and its um, proliferation, certainly in the COCA, made this a financial hub. So you had the MRTA and the Shining Path fighting it out over the profits, in addition to narcos coming in, say, from Colombia, the armed forces from, from, from Peru and others fighting over the money. And I think that this illustrates certainly the geographical regions rich in natural resources often become contested spaces for, for fueling, funding, um, localized regional conflicts. And much of this was internally funded. The human rights abuses the cost of war, I think, and as I keep on intimating widespread by all parties, MRTA, the Shining Path. I haven't mentioned the significant role of the paramilitaries, the community uh, defense leagues, the government forces. Uh, unfortunately, it, the vulnerable uh, indigenous communities, rural populace, mestizos, bore the great brunt of this violence. Um, that's certainly disappearances over the more than two decades of conflict. By the 1990s, the influence of this organization began to wane to some extent, uh, well, not to some extent, certainly with the countermeasures, strategic missteps on part of the MRTA and, and internal divisions, the eventual capture of key leaders, their uh, loss of territorial control, all led to the, to the decline of the organization, their diminished capacity to sustain their insurgency. Another critical figure that we may recall um, who has recently let out of prison uh, in terms of uh, crimes against humanity on humanitarian grounds was um, President Alberto Fujimori. And this marked really his ascendancy to power, a transformation in the conflict and a shift to a hardline counterinsurgency tactic. Um, and I, you know, certainly you see a link in many parts of the world between authoritarian measures um, that are taken under the guise of counterinsurgency. Um, and Fujimori's government has was has been continues to be roundly criticized for these authoritarian practices. 
and his efforts to brutally dismantle the insurgent uh, infrastructure leadership. Another, I think, critical aspect to, to recall in all of this is the Japanese embassy hostage crisis that happened in 1996. A high profile hostage taking at the resident of the residence of the ambassador of Japan in Lima. Um, and the MRTA, what would they wanted? They wanted to negotiate the release of a number of their uh, imprisoned uh, uh, members. And it was a desperate, I think, effort to force concessions. The, the crisis eventually uh, uh, is over after four months, standoff, uh, government forces with assistance to the U.S., storm of the residents. Uh, most of the hostages, bar a few, are, 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 are rescued, but uh, all of the MRTA uh, militants were summarily executed inside. The crisis of, of the hostage certainly was a massive blow to the MRTA, certainly in terms of its operational uh, uh, capacity and in terms of its public perception. This loss of, of personnel, uh, of failure certainly, uh, I think, uh, led to increased fragmentation and loss of overall support. Eventually, Fujimori um, 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 flees the country. Um, um, that's another story. But uh, Peru, for a time, returns to democracy, at which point there is a Truth and Reconciliation Commission established uh, to begin to investigate human rights violations to address the, the, the legacy of the war. In many countries, we do know that there are such commissions to uh, foster um, uh, well-being in post-conflict societies. And a part of that is certainly to acknowledge to learn from the past. So the commission has been uh, aimed to provide historical records, uh, uh, a variety of, I think, uh, of tasks, some, some somewhat successful. In the region I work, uh, there is no, uh, there has not been any historical presence of, of this organization. So I think today there still continues to be a legacy of trauma of the conflict certainly in its, the, the country's subsequent fitful efforts at national reconciliation um, and, and the role certainly of the MRTA and its, I think, enduring legacy is multifaceted. It continues, I think, to, to, to play a role um, like the shining path in, in, in debates over security, over governance, over social justice. Um, I just want to uh, uh, say something now about uh, inner voice aspect, which um, one of uh, the concerns that I've had is, as you've heard, is to look at narratives um, and how they help, you know, certainly shape remembrance, which enables us perhaps to move forward, and in some cases, not, um, and how societies are able to integrate lessons from very, very turbulent history in their own national identities, one should say, certainly in pluri-ethnic uh, nation states like Peru, and then their, uh, their imagined future trajectories. And these are some of the issues really that I take up in the end of the future. So it's really not just an anthropological study. Uh, I think it's a narrative um, which talks in part about the complexity of inner speech and, and interconnects that with the cultural and the political landscapes of the Peruvian Upper Amazon. We speak of the Upper Amazon uh, in, in terms of dividing the Amazon into three portions. The first, close to the Andes, the middle, right where Peru and Bolivia meet, and, and the lower at the very end. So that's what I mean by the Upper Amazon. But for me, certainly, and I think for others, inner speech serves as a window into the the architectures, I would say, of the human consciousness, uh, some sort of scaffolding of the self. It enables us to reveal the intimate relationship between cognition and narrative. So my effort really was to try in this text to elevate the silent dialogues, these personal stories of those from the rural hamlets in specifically some urban centers of the Wyaga Valley 
and to demonstrate the integral role of inner voice in shaping the experiences, the identities um, in the context of memory and trauma and reconciliation. I think that human experience, and especially in times of conflict, is deeply shaped by internal conversations that are as, as diverse and complex as an individuals who conduct them. They provide certainly notions uh, about individual collective psyche, societal norms, cultural values, and the impact of sociopolitical upheavals on the community. They move when we listen, capture them, inscribe them, enables to move beyond statistics, abstract political analysis to reveal the personal, the emotional dimensions of those affected. How communities, families, individuals cope with fear, loss, uncertainty. So the inner voices recounting experiences of trauma contribute, I think, to the anthropological study, certainly of memory, trauma, healing. They help us understand how societies remember their past and societies remember their past in very, very different ways, particularly when it comes to the impact of collective trauma. What are the various pathways towards reconciliation? And in the research, which took many years and hanging out with a wide array of people that many, I think, would have difficult times hanging out with, perhaps. But I came to realize the importance of inner voice displayed by somebody like Magdalena. And all these individuals' names have been changed, as well as these photographs. If in her not tragic, I think, very tragic discussion of Eduardo, reflecting on the nature of the circumstances led to his mortal demise. She tells me I had predicted to a major problem would happen the moment I said Eduardo show up at my homestead in alarm and panic. This introspection uh, reveals her deep understanding of her brother's flaws and the foreboding she felt regarding his pilfering. Jose Maria Arguedas, one of the most important writers, Peruvian writers, in, in his book, uh, the, uh, Los Rios Profundos, portrays inner speech as tapestry woven from the threads of individual and collective consciousness. And he thinks, and I would agree, this reflects the complex interplay of our cultural narratives within the self-construction process. So my time residing in this area as a public anthropologist, one who has been committed to engagement with the inner lives of those who have endured the complexities and conflict of the arduous path towards reconciliation. I think that reaffirms certainly my, my sense of the import, the weightiness of language in shaping consciousness, the core of our self-identity. So I try to unravel this dialogic nature of inner speech, this conversation one has within one that continuously molds one's self of self. Argatus' poetic narrative goes beyond telling a story. It encapsulates an identity that is both personal, communal, rooted, and deep currents of cultural heritage. In the Wayaga Valley, language emerges not just as a conduit for expressing thought, but as an active partner in crafting identity. This is a region, there are dozens of different indigenous languages, so Spanish isn't the only thing in town. This personal story is encountered in my research, not just narrated experiences, they're dialogues of the anima, where language serves as the interlocutor between the individual and the collective, the past and the present. Inner speech, our most Private dialogues are not solitary musings, but a dynamic interplay of voices that contribute to the core of who we are. In this regard, language is a living entity, one that breathes life into reflections and shapes understanding of the world. 
language is a vessel of identity, a bridge between the inner workings of the mind and the outer expressions of culture and belonging. The philosophic underpinnings of intentionality, rationality within speech as discussed by Miro Quesada are also evident in the contemplations and moral deliberations of those I came to know in the Wayaga. Those range from Diego Re Diego's reflections on his combat experiences as an MRTA rebel, likened to strong alcohol in his bloodstream, to Magdalena's tragic premonitions about a brother's death, illustrating the culturally informed rationality that underpins decision-making and ethical considerations. Miro Casada's analysis in Despertar y Proyecto de Filosofar Latinoamericano posits that inner speech is a medium through which culturally informed rationality is manifested. The narratives of the Wayago Valley also contribute to the metaphysical conversations of the mind-body problem. In tandem with the individual stories of the likes of Magdalena and Diego, the solitary nature of inner speech and the challenges of communicating the depths of personal consciousness. Quijano's concept of coloniality of power provides a framework for understanding how socio-historical forces shape both the mental and physical experiences of individuals, a theme recurrent in my interactions with the local population. This aspect of inner speech is particularly palpable in my recollections of Diego's delusion, disillusionment when he speaks into an empty box when discussing politics, revealing a profound sense of marginalization and yearning to be heard. Likewise, Diego's contemplation about his upbringing is tied to what he saw as the root of his social resentment, quote, without a close paternal relationship. Diego felt he was raised without social, was raised with social resentment. So I think these human, pardon me, the inner voice narratives that I've documented, such as Diego's dual feelings of being alive to the world and numb to the surrounding horrors of combat, provide a rich tapestry of insight into the individual, the collective psych, psyche, the societal norms, the impacts of sociopolitical upheavals. The narratives humanize historical conflicts, moving beyond abstract analysis to reveal the personal, the emotional. In the text, The End of the Future, I delve into the intimate narratives to underscore the salience of inner voice. Diego's transformation from civilian to combatant and his reflections on the outcome of the MRTA insurgent are not only personal tales of transition, but an ethnographic window into the broader cultural and social dynamics and play within communities in conflict. There's a moment of powerful collective inner voice where Diego and his comrades thought about their fate if thrown out of a helicopter. Quote, he said they thought that if one of them was thrown out of the helicopter, the other comrades would take the soldiers down with them, end quote. Similarly, a perceptive statement by Diego during his recollection of a confrontation emphasizes the power of inner voice. Quote, it was us, the Tupac Amaro revolutionary movement against the soldiers. It was a living hell for us. We all thought we were going to die. I thought it was the end. The unspoken stories and introspections of those like Mando Rezer, Diego, who have lived through the conflict are essential to our understanding of the human experience, highlighting the transformative power of inner dialogue in both personal and collective realms. As Dr. Gotti had mentioned, I argue that a genuine process of reconciliation is unattainable without a deep comprehension and incorporation of the intricate sociocultural landscapes and the internal dialogues that individuals conduct. Such internal dialogues reflect diverse understanding of justice, 
freedom and collective well-being and underscore a significant theoretical advancement in political anthropology. That durable peace is rooted in acknowledging and validating the person, the personal, often unspoken stories and inner discourses of those who have lived through conflict. Magdalena the victim, the personal recollections I gathered are steeped in themes of resistance, agency, and the struggle for autonomy, central tenets in anthropological discussions about power relations and strategies of resistance. The narratives such as Magdalena's poignant reflections on her brothers, quote, I had a major, I had predicted a major problem would happen in the moment I saw Eduardo show up on my home set in alarm and panic, end quote, reveal the complexity of individual foresight, the depth of familial bonds. Diego, the rebel. In my ethnographic reflections, my own inner voice emerges, especially when considering my feelings toward Diego, a formal, active, very active MRTA rebel. Many had suffered and some had died at the hands of his, at this former Tupac Amaru insurgent. I still felt at ease when I was with Diego, capturing the paradox of human connection amidst the backdrop of violence and struggle. Diego's transform transformation is particularly striking from a civilian who felt normal to a combatant. Mando Razor, where he experienced adrenaline coursing through like strong alcohol. His recounting of combat when he felt alive to the world, on one hand and numb to the surrounding horrors, on the other encapsulates the duality of a soldier's, of a rebel's existence. Diego's meditations on the outcome of his actions as an MRTA insurgent are embedded in an uneasy articulation of inner voice. Quote, I never thought it would turn out like it did, that we would lose so much and gain so little. So many sacrifices for nothing in the end. End quote, he recounted. This reveals Diego's inner voice contemplating the high cost, seemingly futile outcomes of the MRTA's insurgent actions. In conclusion, the end of the future transcends, I believe, an anthropological study. It weaves the pr profound intricacies of inner speech with the cultural and sociopolitical fabric of Peru's upper Amazon. It provides a lens into human consciousness, revealing the interplay between cognition, self-identity, and narrative. In the Huayaga Valley, inner dialogues underscore the essence of memory, trauma, and the pathway to reconciliation. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Bart, for your excellent presentation on the given topic. Uh, really, I encouraged. Uh, dear friends, now it's time for posing questions and interacting with the speaker. I think you should ask me the first question, Dr. Yadav. Uh, okay, uh, I will start with the question. <laughs> yeah. Dear Professor Bart, <clears throat> so what what is the theoretical contribution of this uh, uh, study and, uh, of your book to the human well-being and uh, in what way uh, its applications uh, will really oh, enhance? I, 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 I think there, there, there are multiple. I mean, you, you had mentioned one, which is just considering different ontologies about what, what is justice. 
I think another really important would be just in terms of ethnography. And I'm, as you well know, not familiar with Indian anthropology, so I can't speak to that as an Indian or as a specialist. But certainly, as someone who knows British anthropology and U.S. anthropology, there has not been an extensive ethnographic documentation on about those who've taken up arms. They've taken the side, certainly, of trying to document victims, which I think is very important. But what about individuals that were involved in atrocities? And what would be the logic for somebody who was recruited as a 16, 17 year old who found themselves a decade later running around the jungle with a machine gun? Why and how does one deal with that? I think this is an important question. There are many parts of the world right now that are mired in horrific conflict. I don't believe that we can have a world that's just black and white, so to speak, the good versus the evil. So in order to understand why individuals took up arms and did some dreadful things and annihilated people that were innocent, I'm very curious, what are some of the triggers? What are some of the preconditions so that these could be addressed, so that they could be... There are reasons, I mean, we could talk about, for instance, um, coca and cocaine. One of the, the reasons why there was a massive development of this was urbanization in the capital of Lima during the 1970s and 1980s, which led the government to seek out cheap food. So they told the farmers in the current coca growing areas, hey, grow rice and grow corn, which the farmers did with the belief that they would be paid with loans and price supports. Well, unfortunately, that collapsed. That didn't work. So in its stead, another illicit crop took its place. That's not the only reason it took its place, but those are factors that need to be taken into account that the rebel movements don't just emerge out of nothing. That, that's part of my point, and we can study these historically from from, I don't know, Algeria to, to Cuba to Nicaragua to, to a wide array of, of, and I think there's something to be said to do so in an ethological fashion. Um, I don't believe that I've come up with any grand explanation, no, but I've asked questions, hopefully, that uh, individuals can ask or to, to address. Um, as I mentioned before, over 60% of the territory of Peru is Amazonia. There has been no concerted effort to address this trauma, these issues. Recently had a book presentation in the area. It was a major event and the individuals that represent different sectors of society, it was somewhat cathartic, it was somewhat difficult, but these difficult conversations need to be had Otherwise, there is there's a continuation of impunity and 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 a continuation of injustice. And then so as I said before, that the issues that that uh, that were associated with this conflict haven't gone away, and that there's a possibility that there could be a variation or regrowth because by studying such movements, you realize they have long histories. They emerged from a prior generation that took inspiration. So that's, you know, uh, the, the Nepalese took inspiration of the, of the, of, of you know, of, of, of the Maoists. And so you start thinking of, of the Peruvian Maoists. And you start thinking, okay, where do these ideas go to? So, you know, um, and I, you know, and I think also just addressing your, your, your question, it, it begs difficult ethical issues when it comes to informed consent, uh, when it comes to what what's the objective doing anthropology. The wide, you know, I, I don't have any easy answers for you, but I think some of the models that we, certainly I was trained in, seem somewhat less useful or restrictive and impractical and infantilizing perhaps at times. So... I don't know. I hope that that's helped to understand. And the other would be that 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 this is, you know, an introductory text to a very complicated 
subject. And again, my hope would be that loads of people would get involved and go, hey, this is something, you know, and there are regions that you know very much about and that you'd love others to, to start investigating because you don't have all the answers. I certainly don't. Mm. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the, the ethnography of human crisis, uh, studying the human structural reasons for their conflicts and the crises. That's and right. Trauma. Um, that, that's, yeah. that's, yes, because I think that it was not difficult over some time to realize who was some very traumatized. And just because you've gone through a very difficult experience doesn't mean you're going to be traumatized which is on the other aspect of the resilience. I want to stress that. I maybe didn't stress enough about how people, really, I was amazed how they could get on with their lives. And part of the difference for me personally and some of my friends is their capacity to forgive in a way that I couldn't do. And I don't know if that's a person. I think it's a personality and a cultural aspect, which I think it has its benefits, but it also has its downsides. If you're forgiving constantly, then people get away with some bad things. So it's, it's you know, very different uh, notions of, of, of justice and of, of morality. Um, and, and, and some of the, the things that I saw, I approved of. I didn't mention some of the targets. MRTA in this region targeted gay people. They were killing them. They were targeting shamans. And I would, I'm like, why were you doing that? And they came up with some of their ideological reasoning which was a mixture of of i would say some strange left-wing mixture with catholicism to be honest with some of the versions because it it didn't make sense but it happened and that's something that needs to be you know reconciled people lost their lives because of that fascinating study that what oh thank you just uh, curious, uh, did you happen to talk to these uh, with guns? I mean, these uh, people with uh, guns in their hands, uh, personally. Yeah. Talk to, did you talk to them? Yeah. What is their mindset? I mean, what is their actually? Uh, I mean, future or you know, uh, uh, goal well, or whatever. That you, I, I come down to visit you in Texas. Let's pretend. <laughs> And then <laughs> on the road towards your home, there's yeah. some armed guards. And they're part of this sort of movement. And what are they doing? They're they're charging money for people that are going by and they're mm. somewhat security guard types. Mm. And so that would be one one thing. But there's I don't think I could stress the importance of the coca trade, the cocaine. So some mm. individuals who would still be part of that, maybe that are our age. That we never that got we never out. got out. So we 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 transformed over to the uh, uh, the the drug trade, let's say. Mm -hmm. You know, but but I found I find it you know as you, as you point out, uh, discussions certainly, and I wasn't I didn't have discussions with people that with people that were child soldiers, but I had discussions with people that were. Did their youth child soldiers, yes. Mm. And I would, you know, my wife grew up in this area and I would talk to her about what would the people talk about, particularly, you know, the younger people. And I think that some of the topics were very mundane mm. and they had less to do with the political. My findings were that it was a group of 10 to 20 percent, I'm guessing, who would be the leaders and leaders would typically be school teachers. And the school teachers then, and then when I would talk to people, it became apparent that at the time, this was seen as a very fashionable thing to do. You could get like a uniform and boots, and it would be some sort of get out of Dodge type thing. And they didn't necessarily see it because they felt forgotten by the capital. And it was finally a group that's showing up and, and, you know, discussing their personal needs. So I think at the outset, but then halfway through, there was, I think, some major transformations. The, the coercion, mm. the, the, um, 
the the, the lack of you know uh, the uh, the promises coming through, um, and then the the the, the counterinsurgency, and then individuals who had been thrown out of the military or misfits, whoever or whatever escapees of life joined, and as the early timers would say, they ruined our movement because we shifted from being a an ideologically motivated movement to being a criminal organization devoted to kidnapping and and working with the drug runners because they mm. would provide they would provide protection to the little uh, strips of uh, airstrips and they would uh, charge you know whatever drug runner 10,000 20,000 50,000 per Cessna airplane that's how they got their money and then some of the people, if you and I are the rank and file, we start going, but wait a second, boss man, who is Mr. Che Guevara, he's getting all the money. We're not getting anything. And historically, that was, that's what happened. And when you look at mm -hmm. some of the individuals who are, you know, prominent, we'll say leadership figures are doing quite well in Peru today. They kind of wash their money. Maybe they served time, five, 10 years, but they got out. So it's, it's a, you know, and you see, Variations of this in countries like Colombia, in terms of its civil wars. Mm -hmm. So these, these are very difficult questions, but I do think coming back to Dr. Gade's question, if we have systematic study, we is, we'll say sane, democratic, peace-loving people will provide alternatives, as opposed to not knowing anything about it. And as I don't need to tell you, there. There's a lot of conflict in India, and it would behoove people in the United States, certainly the anthropological community, to know more about it. I would. I mean, it, it, I'm, what I'm trying to argue is it's an important uh, aspect of political anthropology for everybody's good, and 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 to look at it in a serious way. You know, mm -hmm. there are all sorts of of implications, biological implications, migratory implications. You know, what, what happens when soldiers move in? Also, also, genetic, I mean, there's huge, mm -hmm. uh, historically, that, that has been the case. Humans have been at, at war, so to speak, since time memorial. But it, oddly, we're getting more and more cruel. And that seems to be a paradox, which is, you know, an anti-enlightenment one. Because we, we seem to be using our science to be more destructive to each other. And that saddens me. And that's why I come back to the narrative to the inner voice so that when you go home or right now you have a voice you talk to yourself i do mm -hmm. that was what and so that if you record somebody they describe their discussions also they mention their inner voice periodic mm -hmm. like you know i was like i said to myself should i go to the gas station first or go to the bank and so they're revealing that they had this thought process going on and we if we spend a bit more time <laughs> about that i think we'd be better off but there's another tool of, of teasing out particularly among <laughs> but, but particularly among people that are oral cultures that spend an inordinate amount of time speaking and, and, mm. and, and putting significance and and you know in peru definitely that, that uh, the written text is not nearly as important as the oral. So what people say about things, and, and they're all listening, and there could be 10 people in a room, one or two people are talking, but once in a while somebody chirps in a sentence or something, and or, or and it helps shape what people think. It does me, I think about the wars that I lived through, through my parents. My parents mm. were victims of the Second World War, and that deeply shaped my life. Listen to my mm. grandparents, and I think if it did me, I know it shaped the children of Peru, and it shaped, I'm sure, children of conflict zones in India or or Gaza, wherever it is. And that's you know another really important component in terms of understanding. And uh, you know, I have one of my heroes in anthropology is W. H. Rivers. He was a prominent anthropologist of of, of at Cambridge, and was also a psychologist slash psychiatrist. He went on to uh, develop uh, notions against shell shock. In other words, developing ideas of early PTSD. 
He was the early founder of medical anthropology, understanding trauma, so that this is an experience coming out of the First World War, but also out of his experiences interacting with indigenous peoples in the Pacific and realizing they were being destroyed by global forces, and he was disturbed by it. And I think that that's the case of peoples that I'm with are buffeted by forces that they cannot control. And it's creating trauma to their environments, to themselves. And it flares up as we see it here in Kansas with the shooting at Kansas City rally. I mean, uh, right? These are the sorts of things that humans are doing. So mm. I think we think of the triggers behind it. Sorry to bring that term in. It's an inappropriate one in this conversation. So... And I think that we're fortunate as anthropologists that you, I can speak about the biological and the cultural dimensions of things like empathy and violence. I mean, I, I often think about the importance of being introduced to a concept called, as you know, sociobiology and reproductive fitness and all that. And I, part of me believes in it. And, and in other words, the, the, the power that I would have knowing that that, that, that my child is biologically related to me, that I'm going to go the extra mile. I think, well, there is some sort of evolutionary adaptive thing going on. So what mm -hmm. happens when humans are deprived of resources collectively? We do things. And so, you know, and maybe the bonds of religion, and if you and I are Presbyterians, we're going to be bonded together as opposed to being Muslims, or who knows what, I don't know. But and the, the, these are family, I mean, and communities that are traumatized through conflict, some of those bonds are ruptured. And or they were ruptured mm -hmm. in the first place. And that and and that we we perceive them not to be. And it's some of the things that are going on we're interpreting as war, but they're all actually an expression of an earlier tension going on. They're using this as an escape as a as a way of settling scores, so to speak. And that was always unclear in this region because people can masquerade as a rebel, mm. right? And do all sorts of things, you know, you know, and lastly, because I know we have another speaker, one of the more difficult aspects of the book was a particular massacre. And in the government's account, they provide an account of a series of young people that were killed. Mm -hmm. And then I, 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 did a further yeah, investigation yeah. about this. Yeah. And the rebels right. gave a very, yeah. very different account of what mm -hmm. occurred. And right. apparently the victims weren't victims, but were intermediaries with the drug runners. So uh, when you potentially rewrite official histories of who was a victim, who wasn't, it becomes difficult. I don't know. Mm. Because ultimately I don't have, you know, but 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 yeah messy things happen in war yeah mm. thank you thank you very much and very good seeing you see you likewise little black mm. thank you dr rector i think, I think there, there is a question by banerji in the chat box oh okay yes does it say um What, what does it say? I can't read it. Sorry. Okay. Thank Could you, you Professor. But I, yeah, I, I'm reading it now. Oh, thank, thank you, you, Professor. Yeah, thank you, Professor Bartholomew Dean, for this wonderful lecture. I would like to know the reason for calling it inner voice. And, oh, how, and yeah. how is it different from everyday discourse of the Peruvian people? Is yeah, there any question. methodological way? Good, good, question. Good, good question. Good question. Pretend that you and I are walking to to see Michael Crawford and you walk ahead and you're talking to yourself. You're having a conversation with yourself. Right now you are having a bit of a conversation. That's what we call inner voice. It's a personal voice. It's a conversation every single person has. Now, some of us speak in the shower. Some of us, when we're in the car, <laughs> We speak out loud, but there's nobody there. 
-hmm. some of us, you know, are, are deemed pathological as we're speaking too much, you know, when nobody's there. But, but the point being is that the inner voice is a way that shapes who we are because we're telling ourselves things that we kind of know, but we don't know. We're trying, in some cases, convincing ourselves. So me as the anthropologist interviewing you, I could ask you, um, Dr. Barnes, could you please tell me how you decided to become a biological anthropologist? And you gave a lengthy discussion. And then you said, well, one day I was thinking to myself, should I go to university or should I become a businessman? That would be an example of reported inner voice. It could be, you know, a bit stretched in the sense that you didn't actually, but it, it captures it. And when you're discussing people who have gone through conflict or difficult times, it helps to understand issues of motivation, issues of empathy, emotional state. This is a pretty standard thing that we would do in terms of interviewing people for, for, for getting a, a sense so that the inner voice that you as the quarterback or the, the head of the soccer team say certain things, you cuss, you say a swear word, the rest of the team hears you and that also may shape the so-called collective inner voice because they're doing like, oh, damn, the chief is like not so happy with me right now. I got to step up to the plate. So this is another aspect of how it can shape behavior. Does this help understand or respond? I mean, was it your question? But but I think it's a very good question because it helps me to explain it, to understand it myself, to, to be perfectly honest. And it's slippery because how would we understand what's the metrics to determine what inner voice is? Because you can report it to me in terms of your own, say, research. I thought or I was thinking or I felt. Um, but unless you take a diary, it's not, you know, it, 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 it's difficult. But it's another component to, 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 to understand the quality of being a human. But 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 thank you. Yes, uh, dear friends, uh, is there any other question from the uh, participants? Uh, yeah. Th th thank you very much. And I um, certainly would love to be in communication. I can send my email to anybody and Dr. Gade, I'm sure, would provide it. So thank you so much. And I look forward to hearing the next chat. And happy World Anthropology Day, evening, morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Professor Bart, for your excellent <laughs> insights on this um, uh, pioneering work. This is really amazing uh, how this ethnography of this inner voice and the human crisis, uh, trauma and uh, narrative and the memory and uh, building um, uh, excellent platform, uh, giving directions for future anthropologists to explore and to develop the theoretical frameworks so that uh, it, uh, it can be applied uh, to interpret the lessons from the history and uh, uh, anthropology insights for improving the human condition. Uh, from the uh, studying this such kind of uh, pathetic situations and the human uh, sad experiences. Uh, this amazing presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your excellent uh, talk. Mm -hmm. uh, now, this is the Thank time you. for the next talk. Um, uh, I request uh, Professor uh, Barnabas Dan Borno from Nigeria. Mm. Um, he is a, uh, a professor of uh, human anatomy and uh, biological anthropology at the mm. University of um, Ahmadou Bello University from Nigeria. I request mm. you, sir, uh, to introduce our next speaker, Professor Abhijit Guha. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Gede. Um, our next speaker is Professor. Avijit Guha, and he's going to be talking on nation building in Indian anthropology. So he got interested in the study of nation building 
in Indian anthropology because he was socialized to learn that Indian anthropology was a product of colonial masters. So he thought that he could do something a little different. And so he could not bear with the above standpoint of view from his teachers and colleagues and friends in the Indian anthropological circle. So it was particularly painful for him when he found out that most of the post-independence anthropologists in India took it for granted that Indian anthropology and anthropologists followed a Western tradition of anthropology on the Indian soil. Uh, the first thing he did was to counter the point of colonial characterization of Indian anthropology that came to him when he studied a brilliant and pioneering uh, study of the Indian anthropology by Tarak Chandra Das in his work on the Bengal farming of 1943. So he wrote a book and a number of articles on Das during 2010 to 2016. This was followed by his Indian Council of Social Science Research funded uh, on the National History of Indian Anthropology uh, with, between 2018 to 2020, which resulted in a book. So he found through his research and uh, revealed that apart from colonial tradition, there was also an anthropological discourse around nation building with specific focus. This focus was centered on one, the displacement and resettlement of population caused by farming. Two, partition of the country on religious grounds during independence. And three, industrialization and dam building by the state in the initial years of mega planning under the first and second five years plan. All of the three events, that is farming, partition, and mega development, uh, that is building and industrialization of uh, building, installation, building of dams were inseparable from nation building and policy makers needed anthropological advocacy and insight to deal with the problems arising out of the displacement caused by partition and mega development efforts. So the anthropological intervention in this mega events of nation building were minuscule in proportion to the nation magnitude of those episodes. Uh, but in terms of the intensive nature and quality of the micro level findings, the anthropological studies on refugee settlement, rehabilitation, and development caused by displaced persons offer a new area around the discourse on nationalism. So, so far untouched by historians, economists, and political scientists. So who is Professor Abhijit Guha? Professor Abhijit Guha was born in 1956, had his MSc in Anthropology and MPhil Environmental Sciences from the University of Calcutta, and a PhD from Vidya Sagar University in Anthropology. He joined the university, that was the same university, Vidya Sagar, in 1985 and retired as a professor in 2016. He's a senior fellow of the Indian Council of Social Research during January 2018 to January 2020 at the Institute of Development Studies in Calcutta. Published books on land grab and nation building in Indian anthropology in 2022, simultaneously published uh, by Manohar, New Delhi, and Rutledge, London. Published articles, research communications, and book reviews in foreign anthropology, population, and development review, economic and political weekly, the Eastern Anthropologist, Indian Anthropologist, Journal of the Indian Anthropological Society, Man in India, Sociological Bulletin, and Social Change. He also acted as expert in standing committee of the Indian Parliament on the amendment of land acquisition law in 2008, and also a reviewer of research proposal for Warner Grant, USA during November 2020 to May 2022. So I hereby present to you Professor Abhijit Guha for his lecture on nation building in Indian anthropology. Professor Guha, you can take the floor. Uh, 
Hello, hello, Professor Abhijit Goha, sir. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. You can hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Thank you all very much and for the excellent introduction given by Professor Dan Bordo. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really a privilege for me for being invited by the Association of Anthropologists for Humanity or Humankind uh, and to speak well, on... I mean, uh, <laughs> yes. Sir, please unmute your video, sir. Unmute I have unmuted it. Oh, video, video. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, now. Uh, please uh, set your video properly so that we can see you. Uh, can you see me? Yes, the light is behind you and uh, you are towards this. So a very uh, blur, blur picture. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Can you see me? If you yeah, can we'll... turn, if you can turn towards the light, I yeah. think it will be, if possible. Ah, yeah, yeah, improved. Improved. Yes. I do not have much, much more light in this room. Oh no problem, sir. Please I, go ahead. Two lights and I have made them all. Uh, okay, sir. It, it's okay. Yes. So it's a great privilege, as I, I was saying, for me, because to speak on such a a uh, memorable occasion for anthropology, the World Anthropology Day. I'm very happy to speak on this. Uh, mainly I'll be dealing with uh, a part of the history of Indian anthropology. And you see the World Anthropology Day itself has a history. And uh, you all know that it's been celebrated all over the world by the anthropological community. Uh, and in this occasion, in this particular occasion, uh, we, we try to popularize anthropology, we try to make people understand the importance of anthropology at the local and the global level. As the history says that the World Anthropology Day was first conceived by the American Anthropological Association uh, and it was conceived in uh, 2015 and first to celebrate uh, as an anthropology day, as a national anthropology day for United States of America. But just on the next mm -hmm. year, it was decided that since anthropology deals with human beings all over the world in all time and space, so uh, it should not be restricted to a single country. So anthropology should be uh, uh, taught every, uh, should be, uh, this anthropology day should be celebrated all over the world. So this is a memorable occasion. Uh, so I am also privileged uh, for being allowed to speak in this uh, occasion. So what I will be talking today is on the a part of the history of Indian anthropology. Now, to tell you very frankly, when I I was thinking of this, uh, thinking of researching on this topic. Uh, I found that there is virtually no literature, no comprehensive literature on the history of Indian anthropology. So, so I started, there was only one book written by a famous Indian anthropologist uh, named L.P. Vidarthi and his two volume book it was then during my research and student days was regarded as the only, uh, only book available for the study of uh, history of Indian anthropology. Uh, but if you open the pages of this book, you won't find uh, uh, a very comprehensive account of all aspects 
of anthropology in India, particularly the biological part is almost totally absent, the history of biological part. Uh, it mainly deals with uh, social cultural anthropology and that too is divided under separate chapters. I learned that this book was actually written uh, as a compendium, as a collection of articles written by Dr. Bidarthi at various points of time, and they, then they were put together in two volumes. So in a sense, it was not a comprehensive account of the history of Indian anthropology. So with this, I started, uh, I started to search, but my search was not uh, non-purposive. It was purposive because whatever I knew about the history of Indian anthropology uh, was that anthropology in India was started by the British colonial administration. And that too, they started it uh, mainly for two purposes. One purpose was to know the uh, diversity of this country, because India, you know, that it's a very culturally and biologically diverse uh, country. So for the British colonialists, they thought that it was uh, it would be very much essential for them uh, to know the cultural and biological diversities of population uh, living in all every part of this country. So they started their uh, project of knowing uh, uh, knowing the unknown people of India. So this was the first effort, and with this, roughly around uh, 1784, the Asiatic Society. Uh, one of the major learning centers was established by a philologist uh, and this Asiatic society also started some amount of anthropological investigations. Then roughly around 1880s, the first census operations in India began and with these census operations, large volumes of field-based uh, census books uh, census reports were prepared by the British administrators and notable among them was uh, a British anthropologist himself. His name was J. H. Hutton. Uh, he made a very good uh, study of Indian populations, particularly on the different castes and sub-castes of India uh, in his uh, census operations. So uh, a kind of uh, what you may call a colonial anthropology, that is an anthropology uh, which tries to uncover the diversities of cultures and biologies over the subcontinent, uh, was being gradually uh, uh, being done by the British colonialists. And with the Asiatic Society and uh, the census operations, the first anthropological investigations of Indian populations began. Then, uh, around 1920, the first anthropology department at the University of Calcutta, from where I have graduated and took my postgraduate degree. <coughs> this uh, 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 University of Calcutta anthropology department was the oldest anthropology department in India, and there the study and teaching of anthropology began uh, in a very systematic and comprehensive manner. So after independence, uh, what happened actually, uh, a, a large number of anthropologists, mainly the mainstream anthropologists, by that time another event occurred in 1946 under the leadership of Dr. B.S. Guha, a famous Indian anthropologist, and he was a biological anthropologist basically. Dr. B.S. Guha founded the first governmental organization of anthropologists in India named Anthropological Survey of India. Initially, its name was Department of Anthropology, but later it was changed to Anthropological Survey of India. So Anthropological Survey of India was established in 1946, a little before the independence. And with these uh, efforts, the census operation, the Asiatic Society, and finally, Anthropological Survey of India, and then uh, the Department of Anthropology at Calcutta University. All these things have culminated into the effort of what we now study as anthropology in India. Now, what is important in this regard is that uh, this study of 
uh, why the uh, British anthropologists in India and later on many American anthropologists who have come to India and studied Indian population from various aspects, from various dimensions. And that resulted in a lot of uh, literature on anthropology in India. And the census operations, all these have also yielded a huge amount of very valuable, useful information on the uh, what we call tribes and castes and other populations of India. In fact, the first census commissioner, H. H. Rizle, in India, uh, uh, wrote a very famous book named Tribes and Castes of Bengal. And that is still a very uh, authentic source of information on the Indian populations. So what I'm trying to convey uh, is that the, I have briefly uh, sketched the major landmark events which led to the growth and development of anthropology in India. Uh, uh, what actually emerged from this was not a history, but an idea which prevailed among the uh, anthropologists in India was that anthropology in India was largely a colonial product. Anthropology was started in India by the colonialists and when the colonialists founded this, this subject, they had one main objective in their mind, that is uh, how to better rule these Indian population on which their run their colony for the next 200 years. So this kind of uh, reading of uh, Indian anthropology by the Indian anthropologists themselves, interestingly, no foreign anthropologist, although they have studied the Indian population through and through, and many important contributions have come from, they're still coming uh, um, from foreign anthropologists because uh, anthropologically India is a very interesting co country. Uh, one uh, uh, 19th century anthropologist, Arthur Keith, Sir Arthur Keith, he called that India is an ethnological paradox. So for any anthropologist interested in any aspect of human life, may go and study uh, the Indian populations. So the interest of the anthropologists in studying uh, India uh, the was ignited definitely by the founding of the Asiatic Society and later census operations, etc. Uh, but till today, it continues among the anthropologists and anthropologists from all over the world come to India uh, to study uh, the Indian populations and they try to develop, try to build up their ideas, uh, anthropological theories, methods, etc. by studying in India. So this is the importance of Indian anthropology, and it was uh, it's a very uh, fitting occasion to speak on uh, Indian anthropology on the World Anthropology Day. So, because Indian anthropology from the very beginning was connected with the anthropology of the world, Indian anthropology was never a local affair. That is very important. The next important thing is that uh, Indian anthropology uh, uh, developed. Indian anthropology developed in the hands of uh, British colonialists and many foreign anthropologists, but also there were notable Indian scholars who were doing, uh, who have done wonderful and very remarkable studies uh, on Indian populations. Uh, uh, one example which immediately comes to mind was uh, uh, the anthropologist he was not professionally trained as an anthropologist uh, in the middle of the, from middle of the 19th century to the uh, later part of 19th century. He worked uh, and he was located in uh, Eastern India and he was the founder of uh, one of the earliest professional journals in anthropology named Man in India, which is still being published. His name was uh, S.C. Roy, Sharad Chandra Roy. Sharachandra Roy lived in Rachi and he made uh, memorable uh, contributions, particularly on the Mundas and Oraos, uh, these large two, two central and eastern Indian tribes uh, on, uh, uh, in, uh, in his journals and books. So 
with uh, SC Roy, we can further go on uh, to look at the studies of other notable anthropologists like Biroja uh, Shankar Guho or a little earlier, uh, uh, Dr. Panchanan Mitro, and later gradually many scholars uh, from different parts of India. And Bengal played a very important part, particularly with the establishment of anthropology department at Calcutta University, a very, very important part in the growth and development of anthropology in India. So the next important point which I would like to emphasize uh, is that although anthropology in India developed uh, with, uh, with a lot of enthusiasm, inspiration and practical interests as well, uh, uh, anthropology or anthropology in India was gradually developing into its maturity and except Vidarthi, no one has made any attempt uh, to make a sense out of this development. So there were various anthropological studies done on different uh, communities in India, but there was hardly any attempt by any Indian anthropologist or even by an historian to write a very systematic uh, uh, history of Indian anthropology. But we find in case of other subjects uh, that there were some persons, for example, physics or chemistry, there were some persons who wrote uh, very, very important and good histories of those subjects. But in case of anthropology, we hardly find any systematic or comprehensive uh, history or historiography in the modern terminology. Uh, on Indian anthropology today. So this struck me that why there is no history of Indian anthropology? Why, there, there, why no anthropologist, either foreign or Indian, has made any attempt to write a comprehensive history of our discipline? Although we have a series of uh, uh, what I would call characterizations, not based on uh, 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 thorough systematic uh, learning through historical archives, data documents, a kind of, uh, I would say, a set of allegations. And interestingly, these allegations were made by Indian anthropologists themselves that Indian anthropology is a product of colonialism, British colonialism. And many have gone to the extent of saying that Till today, at, at, that is when they were saying this, and it was in, uh, in in 70s, 80s, they were saying that Indian anthropology has not yet been able to stand on its own feet. So uh, there is British anthropology, there is American anthropology, there is French anthropology, but hardly there is uh, a an Indian anthropology. So they even said that Indian, what the Indian anthropologists have done on the Indian soil is to follow their British predecessors and sometimes the American anthropologists or at best the French anthropologists. So where is Indian anthropology? Where is the, uh, uh, where is the subject? Where is the subject done by the uh, Indians? That was the major allegation put forward uh, by the Indian anthropology. So two things, you have to consider two things. When I started, my, I'm trying to bring you to my timeline. When I started uh, uh, to take up the history of Indian anthropology, I found these two things. On the one hand, there is a systematic absence of on the writing of history of Indian anthropology. And second, there is a vague idea that Indian anthropology is basically a product of colonialism. So with these two kinds of things, as I said in the abstract, uh, uh, that with these two kinds of thing, I was socialized to learn anthropology. So when I first became a student at Calcutta University, uh, I learned a lot outside my classroom. And there, my senior, some of my senior, uh, seniors, senior, uh, we, we used to call them dadas, uh, what they 
were discussing with us that uh, you see uh, what you have been taught in the class is part of anthropology. Actually, anthropology is a colonial product. Anthropologists have served colonialism, not only in India, but in other parts of the world. And they also used to give us some literature on this, for example, Talal Ashad's famous book, Anthropology and Colonialism. So all these kinds of things were given to us, were circulated, because at that time at Calcutta University, there was a great influence of leftism, uh, leftist student politics. And we were socialized in that politics to learn that anthropology or the anthropologists in India were, uh, were uh, serving colonialism by, uh, 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 by their subject. So that's all. So this kind of image was created uh, in the minds of our generation. I do not know uh, what kind of image uh, the present generation uh, uh, is full with. But my, in my generation, uh, anthropology uh, was characterized as a kind of colonial subject. So nothing uh, uh, could be done with this. This will continue. And anthropology has uh, a bleak future. That was the kind of thing uh, with which we were being socialized uh, during our student days. So on the one hand, there was an absence of scholarly work on the history of Indian anthropology, except Vidarthi's one or two articles uh, in which Vidarthi tried to uh, uh, subdivide the history of an Indian anthropology into three important periods, the formative period, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so we read those things. We uh, uh, wrote this, wrote about what we have read in our answer scripts, but in our inner mind, as Bartholomew was uh, speaking to us, I was listening to the last part of his very interesting lecture that one has to speak uh, to his inner voice. So our inner voice uh, was telling us that what you are doing, uh, that you are serving the colonialists, you are serving the rulers. Uh, uh, what your forefathers have done uh, was to serve uh, a colonial project. So that was, that may be our inner voice which was speaking to us. On the outer voice, we were reading with that thing, we were writing them in our answer scripts. We got good marks and passed out from the university. And this is very uh, uh, interesting uh, development which occurred during that time. So with, with this kind of uh, popular, semi-popular, or what I would call semi-academic uh, notions about anthropology that prevailed when I took up this study of uh, the history of Indian anthropology and could finally finish with some articles and books. Uh, so my starting point was that, uh, was there any, uh, uh, Indian anthropologist who studied nation building? Was there any anthropologist in India uh, who tried to do uh, something about uh, new India, which was growing after independence? Uh, it may be taken for granted that during the colonial period, it was not possible for Indian anthropologists to build up their nation uh, because the, uh, uh, in India was then a colony. But what happened uh, after we got independence? And it's now uh, uh, 70 years on that we are uh, we have uh, got our independence. So uh, uh, was not there any kind of study by any Indian anthropologist which can be called uh, contribution uh, to uh, Indian anthropology? Yes. Uh, the answer I sought was to uh, was to be uh, looked at from a different viewpoint. So what were the problems of before the Indian nation? What were the problems that the Indian nation was facing? Uh, another interesting thing is that nation building as such uh, is not a very easy cup of tea 
for the anthropologists because anthropologists so far, anthropologists all over the world, were engaged more in studying small communities and they developed some unique methods, for example, participant observation uh, and the sub methods like genealogical method, case study, et cetera, et cetera, which we teach to our students uh, in our classrooms or in our field work sessions. So anthropology as a subject is a very unique one. It looks at human beings from a bio biocultural perspective, that's true. But the methods anthropologists adopt are very much suited to study small communities. There is no denying of this fact. So when, if one asks that, uh, uh, how would you study a nation? It is very difficult to answer for an anthropologist, even till today, because there is no systematic and comprehensive kind of uh, attempt by the anthropologist to study nations all over the world. The way political scientists, the way economists, uh, even the way uh, literatures study nation is not possible by anthropological methods. Anthropology as a subject developed to study specific communities in particular locales by making long-term participant observations and using all kind of accessories suited to study a community over a considerable period of time. And the results of this study are then and presented before the public as a kind of thing which we call ethnographic reports or ethnographies. Now, ethnography as such is a method uh, of very put very simply description of cultures. Now various experimentations on ethnographies uh, are being made, and nowadays anthropologists are uh, 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 are writing ethnographies in which the presence of the anthropologist herself or himself uh, uh, becomes very much visible in the pages of the ethnography. That has given a very interesting turn. Uh, in recent anthropological uh, writings and literature, where the anthropologist becomes a character, sometimes the central character of the people they have been observing, they are observing. So we experimented on ethnography. Ethnography is our chief method, study of societies at the small scale, uh, being the sine qua non of the anthropologist. How then can an, an anthropologist study such a big thing as nation, where many communities are involved, where many uh, different kinds of mega events are involved. Questions uh, were raised, are anthropologists uh, are fitted? Are anthropologists the fit persons to study the nation the way political scientists or economists can do? So my start searching question was twofold. One, that was there any attempt by the anthropologists just after the independence of the country to contribute to the building of the new nation? This is number one. Number two, can there be any method by which the anthropologists can study the process of nation building? So with these two research, major research questions in my hand, I started to look at the archive in order to search uh, the, what really happened uh, at the time of uh, nation building, uh, uh, what the anthropologists were doing at that time. So I, when I searched through the pages of the journals, uh, very old journals, for example, the oldest journal founded by uh, uh, S.C. Roy, uh, Man in India. Then there, were the, there was another famous journal, which was uh, which started much later uh, at Lucknow by the famous anthropologist, uh, Professor D.N. Mojunga. Uh, it was the Eastern anthropologist. And then there was uh, the uh, journal named Indian Anthropological Society, founded by Nimal Kumar Bose. Uh, 
in Calcutta. And then there was in Delhi, the Delhi Anthropology Department started another journal named Indian Anthropologist. So with these three, four journals uh, in my hand, I was started to flip through the pages to, to find out whether there is any study by any anthropologist on nation building. And what were the specific uh, studies anthropologists were doing uh, during the time of nation building. So my search uh, for uh, many months in the libraries of Anthropological Survey of India and Calcutta University uh, have yielded some materials, not much, not uh, a very big amount of material, uh, based on which I could say that, well, nation building was also being studied by the anthropologists. So how I could come to this conclusion uh, is, the, uh, is, the, is, is the part of my lecture which I will narrate now. So when I embarked on this problem, I found that majority of the anthropological works truly was engaged in the British colonial tradition. That is finding out communities, studying them in detail, and then writing a report of that community. Uh, this was the main theme. Now, there were variations around the main theme. And for the biological anthropologists, it was uh, to uh, look for communities to study their physical features. Their, for example, it earlier started with the study of so-called racial studies. Later, uh, it, was, it turned into studies of nutrition, uh, studies on health, uh, studies on various aspects of disease, et cetera, et cetera, uh, of communities were studying. But still, majority of the anthropological studies uh, uh, were done uh, on specific communities. Large-scale anthropological studies have also been undertaken uh, for example, by the Anthropological Survey of India studies under the able leadership of uh, K.S. Shin, who was a histo historical anthropologist. He was a historian who also contributed uh, to the study of anthropology in India. And he was the director general of Anthropological Survey of India. He's, he launched a project named People of India Project. Now, this in People of India project, uh, thousands of communities were identified all over India by the surveyors, trained surveyors at Anthropological Survey of India. Many of my friends participated in this and they have done wonderful studies. So these uh, kind of studies were, these large scale anthropological studies were done uh, under the behest of the largest organization of anthropologists in the world namely the Anthropological Survey of India. The largest governmental organization of anthropologists in the world is still Anthropological Survey of India. So with this massive manpower uh, and uh, a good amount of uh, trained uh, anthropologists, these People of India project uh, have already been completed and books are, not all the books have come up, but a number of books, a number of volumes have come up on the People of India project. But on a closer look, this People of India project uh, did not bring into light uh, any analytical history of anthropology in India. Its objective was not also like that. The People of India project's main objective was to uh, make, a, make an encyclopedic uh, technical survey of the different communities, their present status, their Etc., etc., all these kinds of things were studied. So, if you look at the pages of the People of India, you will find that this People of India project uh, uh, is also a kind of uh, uh, work uh, done by the first census commissioner in India, the H.H. Uh, H. Risley, the uh, first registrar general of Indian census. What Risley did in the uh, 1870s, 80s um, was a large scale survey of the whole country. And he particularly emphasized, concentrated on the eastern part, particularly Bengal. 
but then the whole India was his focus and the People of India project taken up in the post-independence period was also a kind of, uh, I won't say replica, but it's, it's, it's a kind of continuation of the uh, colonial uh, Rieslingian project. So this People of India project uh, uh, by the conducted by the Anthropological Survey of India is another example of how anthropologists uh, are doing in India. So when I was searching for uh, nation building, when I was searching for uh, uh, the works uh, done to contribute in the mega process of nation building or national planning, I really didn't find any study done by the anthropologists during that period, except a few brilliant exceptions. And these few brilliant ex exceptions became uh, the uh, main point, main theme of my uh, research on nation building in Indian anthropology. So what I have really done is uh, I, I tried to identify that who were the anthropologists and what kind of study they have made by keeping India as a whole in his or her mind. And what were the problems of nation building in India at the time? So by through my readings in other uh, uh, disciplines, other literature outside anthropology, I found that nation building uh, in, the, in its early years faced uh, mainly uh, one very important pressing problem uh, for the planners, for the uh, politicians, the ministers, etc., of our new nation. And that problem was the partition of the country, particularly at the eastern, uh, eastern region of the country, the partition of Bengal. And which caused a large number of influx of refugees from now Bangladesh into the Indian, Indian uh, uh, into, into our country, into India. So these influx of refugees, these coming of millions of people, millions of helpless uh, people, from Bangladesh to India was one of the major problems for the early nation builders. You won't find any nation builder during that time who didn't speak about uh, uh, the partition of Bengal and the influx of refugees, starting from our first prime minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, to uh, many other major leaders, Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, et cetera, et cetera. So, how anthropologists dealt with this problem? That was my question. So while searching through the literature, as I was said, I was rather dismayed to find there is hardly any literature on the influx of refugees and their problems by the anthropologists. So anthropologists hardly took up any study on the refugee problem in Bengal. There were a number of Bengali anthropologists. There, were, there was the Department of Anthropology, the oldest Department of Anthropology at the University of Calcutta, but hardly uh, they took up uh, any good study on the influx of refugees. The only study which I found was a study done by uh, one very famous Indian anthropologist, his name was Shurajit Chandra Sinha. Shurajit Chandra Sinha conducted a study uh, on the refugee rehabilitation in uh, the Andaman Islands from uh, Bengal. So government at that time thought of transporting these refugees because it was creating a lot of Bengal was already a very uh, uh, a state with a very high population density. So in case of Punjab, what happened, the successful transfer of 
uh, populations took place between DJ in Pakistan and uh, DJ in Punjab. But that didn't happen in Bengal. In Bengal, refugees came and they came and there was really a problem of dealing, of handling with this numerous uh, population at our place. So the government thought, government decided, DJ in Bengal government and the central government, they decided that these refugees could be transported to a place uh, where there is uh, ample land resources and where these people could restart their lives and they could uh, live there peacefully. So it, this project was taken up and large number of refugees were transported to uh, many islands of uh, Andaman and there they started to live their lives. So Shurajit Chandra Sinha being an anthropologist, he was then at that time just an MSc past anthropology student. And by some set of circumstances, he, probably he was a very brilliant student and the government asked Calcutta University to make an anthropological study of the refugee problem in Andaman. So an anthropologist was searched out and the teachers might have recommended Shurujit Sinha's name. And Shurujit Sinha was given the task of conducting a, an anthropological inquiry into the uh, refugee pro, re, into the lives of the refugees at Andaman. Shurujit Sinha went there and stayed there, made participant observation and did a wonderful study and uh, uh, it is really a very shameful thing that uh, we do, we still have not yet been able to publish this in the form even of by a, in a small book by the anthropological server. The report is there in the anthropological server department. I have found it with the help of my some friends in the anthropology department. They were kind enough to give me that the DDN Deputy Director Sasi Kumar, I do not know whether he is present uh, in today's talk uh, or not. He was kind enough to collect this document for me and there I found Shurit Sinha's comprehensive uh, study, anthropological study of the displaced refugees uh, in the uh, Andaman Islands and what were the problems they were facing, problems of housing, Problem, problems of uh, relationship between the host population and the others. And all these kinds of problems uh, were being thoroughly studied and not only studied, the government of India and the government of West Bengal was given some suggestions by uh, the anthropologist Shuril Sina, who was just then an MSc past student. He was given enough freedom to write up any recommendations for the government. So Shurajit Sina gave a set of recommendations from there. And alas, if we look at the uh, Andaman situation nowadays, we, we, we hardly find uh, the government has taken uh, any substantial uh, part of the recommendations of Sina report uh, in their implementation record. That, 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 that is the reason for that. That is another story and not, not part of my uh, lecture today. So this was one of the major and remarkable studies done by Professor Shurajit Chandra Sinha, who happened to be my teacher as well. So Sinha also did not make any follow-up after that, or, nor did he uh, write any paper or any book on this in any professional journal of anthropology. The very valuable anthropological report on uh, the contribution of the anthropologist towards nation building because refugee influx was then one of the uh, priority problems uh, for the new nation builders in India. Next, I would come to another important study made by another very famous anthropologist who is uh, popularly and 
to the uh, world is also known as uh, the uh, one of the uh, most important biological or physical anthropologists uh, of uh, in India. Dr. Biraja Shankar Guho, who had an untimely death. Uh, Biraja Shankar Guho, he was the uh, first director, founding director of Anthropological Survey of India. And he, he also taught for some time at the University of Calcutta. Dr. Biraja Shankar Guho, as I was telling, that the one of the major problems was the refugee uh, influx and the successful rehabilitation and resettlement of refugees uh, outside Bengal, but Guho was dealing with a problem which was much closer at home. It was the resettlement of refugees within Bengal. He particularly dealt with two resettlement colonies, one in a place named Jirat, which is in Hooghly district, and another right within the um, Calcutta city. It was and it is named as Ajadgar. So these two refugee resettlement colonies were being studied not by Guho uh, uh, alone, but by his team of trained anthropologists from Anthropological Survey of India. And that resulted in a very good book, although that book is very rare book now, and I had to purchase this book from, you'll be surprised to know, uh, from a bookseller at the, located at Germany. Uh, they, they had a copy of this book and I had to buy it from them. Uh, yes, Anthropological Survey of India has a copy. I have later seen that book, but very few people read it or very few people, few people know about it at all. It's a very fat book and it's a thorough report of the problems of refugees uh, in the places where they have been, they have been rehabilitated. And the title of the report was Social Tensions Among the Refugees Coming from East Pakistan. So there Guho used, Guho was also trained in psychology uh, and he was a doctorate from Harvard University. Uh, and he knew the, all the psychological techniques uh, of studying in the uh, tensions in a particular community, and uh, he was a, a part of UNESCO project. Uh, so, uh, Guho study was again a very brilliant study on the social tensions among the refugees, and that I consider as another very, very important uh, study towards nation building in India. I think I don't have much time now because I have to leave some time. Uh, yes. yes, yes, thank you. Thank you, Dean. I, I have given you the uh, copy. Uh, yes. Will Gande talk something? Have I finished my time? Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, another five to ten minutes, you can continue, sir. Five to ten minutes. Okay, yes. I'm, I'm fast finishing up. Uh, then after uh, uh, after Guha study, uh, we find another uh, very important. As I was saying, that nation building with nation building in New India, new problems have also emerged, and uh, uh, one was the refugee problem the resettlement of refugee problems and anthropologists contributed uh, not in great numbers, but there were few remarkable, there were two, at least two very important anthropological studies on the resettlement of refugees in the Andaman Islands and second, the studies on social tensions by none other, none other than uh, Dr. B. S. Guho, the founder, uh, director of the Anthropological Survey of India. Uh, then I would come to another very important study done by uh, Iyavati Karve. Uh, and this study was done in, uh, the, uh, uh, in the Deccan region uh, by Iyavati Karve. And this study was done on the, this large number of displacement. Uh, and it is, it is one of the, it is the earliest study on displacement by any anthropologist in India. 
And going by world standard also, you hardly find any study uh, during that time. Uh, uh, the authority on displacement, Professor Michael Sarnia has personally communicated to me saying that this is how where could you find this study? I found, I said I found it in the library uh, at the Deccan College Library, Pune. Uh, this book is there. And this book was written uh, not from a theoretical perspective. Iravati Karve had personally gone to the villages where people have been displaced, where, where their lands were submerged by the building of one of the early dams uh, in the post-independence period. It was a big dam. The name of the river is Koyana River. It's a river in Maharashtra. And there, Iravati Karve with her team had studied uh, the Iravati Karve initially was trained in uh, uh, in uh, India in uh, Deccan in Deccan College Pune and then he went to Berlin University there she did her PhD in physical anthropology came back to India and she did a good number of studies on social anthropology as well she was a profound scholar in Sanskrit and Sanskritic literature and she had good command over Sanskrit ancient Sanskrit literature and wrote a number of articles and books on Indian society, culture, civilization, etc. We know that Iravati Karve, but we hardly know that Iravati Karve, under the sponsorship of the Planning Commission of India, conducted a study on the first major displacement caused by uh, the development effort of the young India. So Iravati Karve also cautioned our then planners not to take up, not to build up big dams like this. And you see what happened uh, several decades later. You all know about uh, Narmada Dam displacement and the whole kind of thing, uh, whole chain of events uh, which was caused after it. So Iravati Karve's study was one of the earliest pointers uh, to the nation builders which way to go. So this is, I, I won't say much on Iravati Karve because the details is there in my book. Uh, uh, I would uh, come up with another important study done by uh, uh, Dr. B.K. Rayavarman. B.K. Rayavarman was a trained anthropologist. He was a student at Calcutta University. He studied the displacement caused by uh, one of the major state-owned uh, heavy industries in India. Because you know the Nehru Maharajish joint plan during the first two, two, two plan periods was to build up big dams, big roads, uh, uh, and big industries, just in the Soviet model. And these big, big uh, industries and dams, what really they co can cause to the local people, and what were the aspects which were overlooked while building up the big industries. So, VK government studied the this process. And if you go to his book, it was a good book there. Uh, and this book was published by the government. And this was again a project taken up by the government of India. So sometimes we allege the government by saying that government is not looking after the anthropologists. Government is, is not understanding the importance of anthropology. If you go to the early part of the history of anthropology in India, you find just the opposite kind of thing. It was the government who invited the anthropologists. It was the government who engaged anthropologists like Shurit Sina, B.S. Guha, uh, Iravati Karve to study the problems caused by government's own development efforts. So this is the history. The history is not that government is neglecting. Government in India is neglecting uh, the subject anthropology. Not at all. Lastly, I will come to the famous study with which, in fact, I was uh, 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 my my attention to history of Indian anthropology was turning into different direction. Was the famous study done by Tarak Chandra Das? Tarak Chandra Das is a little known, and I have said in one of my papers that a marginalized anthropologist in India. Tarak Chandra Das, just before independence, took up. A very interesting study, and it was not funded by the DDN government. Uh, later, Calcutta University gave some money to continue the project, and 
This resulted in a book which was published by Calcutta University, still a rare book, which you won't find, but I have uploaded the whole book in the um, uh, academia.edu, one can read it. The name of the book is Bengal Famine. And you know, the Bengal Famine of 1943 caused a havoc in the uh, life of people in the rural and urban areas of Bengal. When millions of famine affected people had come to Calcutta just in search of food, and many of them died right on the streets. And Tarak Das, sitting at Calcutta University, could not overlook this thing. So he, with his team of students, and with very small uh, kind of financial support, either from the government or from any other external sources, he conducted a thorough and detailed study of the famine affected people in uh, Bengal. And the study was such a valuable kind of study that much, much later, the Nobel laureate economist Amartya Sen, uh, in his famous book, Poverty and Famines, he had taken uh, from Tarak Chandra Dash's book because of its reliable records and reports. So if you go through Sen's book, you will find that how many times Tarak Chandra Dash's book have been referenced there, have been cited. So this is this itself shows the value of the book. But alas, we anthropologists today are yet to really appreciate Tarak Chandra Dash's study on Bengal famine. I have written a number of articles, and in my book also I have written on, and I have also written a small book on Tarak Chandra Dash, published by a Delhi-based publisher. So. Tarak Chandra Dash's work, uh, though it was conducted during the uh, before the independence period, but it has had a tremendous effect in uh, the post-independence period as well, because you know the uh, the effect of Bengal famine continued for uh, several years even after the uh, independence. So Das also suggested a number of measures. Uh, about how to combat famine, uh, how relief and rehabilitation should be done, what kind of surveys are to be made, which he himself had conducted. So in conclusion, I would say that what I have tried to point out is that, that nation building for the Indian anthropologists was uh, not a kind of dream project, which they are still thinking now was taken up, the challenge was taken up, not only by our national leaders and politicians of that time, not only by political scientists and economists who were planners and at the helm of all affairs, but also by the anthropologists. It is true that anthropological contributions on uh, the impact of dam building, on the impact of big uh, projects, big industrial projects, or on the impact of Bengal famine on uh, human populations, nation building was definitely taken up as a challenge also by the anthropologists. And they have done remarkable studies in India, which are still being overlooked, or sometimes the, the book or the reports prepared by the anthropologists are also uh, very, very rare uh, in the public eye. So in another of my articles, the public visibility of anthropology, I was arguing that visibility of anthropology, particularly in India, can be enhanced, can be increased by bringing back the history of what our founders, what our forefathers have really done. Maybe the mainstream anthropology, even during that time, was following the colonial tradition. But if you look at this tradition, uh, which was going side by side with some, you may call these are exceptional things, but, but these were exceptions, but these exceptions show the way. These exceptions on the one hand may prove the rule, but these exceptions were also showing the new way of building up a truly nationalist anthropology in India. Now, when I say nationalist anthropology, this, this term, this very term nowadays in India 
they mean uh, different kinds of things to different people. Some may think that nationalist anthropology will be a kind of uh, Hindu anthropology. No, I'm not talking about uh, Hindu anthropology. There was Hindu anthropology uh, during the British period. I, I didn't have much time to discuss about Hindu anthropology, but Hindu anthropology was, uh, was a reality uh, uh, in the late 30s. Uh, and there, there is literature on that. Uh, uh, I don't have much time to talk on Hindu anthropology today, but nationalist anthropology is not Hindu anthropology. Nationalist anthropology is an anthropology which will look at the problems of real problems of nation, real problems of nation building, problems of food, problems of shelter, problems of clothing, problems of housing, problems of displacement, uh, problems of refugee resettlement, etc., etc. These were already being done by some of our remarkable pioneers. So with this, uh, and, and, and another thing is about method, because this is a le lecture on anthropology, so I must talk something about methods. What about the methods uh, of anthropology when they took up these problems? Uh, was there any alternative method? My answer is no. The same old classical methods of anthropology, that is collecting case studies, doing field work and participant observation, and conducting thorough interviews with the affected people, these studies were conducted. Studies by Shurjit Sina was conducted by that, by these methods. Studies of B.S. Buho was also conducted with some addition of psychological methods, etc. But that anthropologists can very well incorporate into their uh, baggage. So uh, the study by Shurjit Sina, by Yavati Karge, by B.K. Rayavarman, all these studies they didn't invent any magical method to participate in the process of nation building. They used the same traditional methods which we still teach in the classes, genealogy, participant observation, field work, et cetera, et cetera. Then using these methods for a considerable period of time to look at the population much more closely. And then finally you come up with your report and uh, the, the you must also have an eye to that. How do you contribute uh, to the welfare, to the development of this people? So these studies were not done for some anthropological curiosities, for fulfilling some anthropological curiosities, but by for, for solving the real problems of the nation. So anthropologists with their tradition, my lesson is that anthropologists with their uh, classical and traditional methods developed over last 100 years can very well apply it to the new and newer problems of nation building. Because as long as nation is there, problems of nation building will always be there. It was not like that, the nation building was a problem during our, uh, just after our independence. Nation building, the problems of nation building will always be there uh, because we want to live in a good nation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor uh, Abhijit Guha, sir, for your valuable uh, insights on nation building in Indian anthropology. <clears throat> My dear friends, um, uh, this is a time for interacting with the speaker. We have a distinguished scholar and the professor uh, who has uh, been a uh, great contributing and uh, the contemporary anthropologist which India feels proud of him. So this is a wonderful time for you to pose questions to him. Yes, already I have, I have 10 comments and questions in the chat box. Uh, should I? Uh, yeah, please, please, sir. So one question was uh, by Vinita. Uh, Vinita has said that in India, social anthropology unfortunately cannot be separated from sociology. Yes, I agree, but why unfortunate? Unfortunate. Why unfortunate? Uh, can I say anything, something? Yes, yes, sure. Unfortunate because what has happened is that sociology has taken 
precedence over anthropology in India. You have far more departments uh, and a lot of people who are unaware of anthropology. And my own experience tells me that. I think I think anthropology should uh, uh, anthropology still survives as a kind of biocultural study of human beings in all time and space. And sociology is, uh, doesn't study the biological aspects. And this is a very simple answer. Uh, sociology, uh, uh, well, social anthropology has some similarities with sociology, but my observation is that uh, that does not uh, really endanger anthropology. What is really endangering anthropologists are that we have our enemy within. We are not employing our methods to its fullest extent. We are not doing things which uh, can really contribute to the building of the nation. As I had said that, and I had tried to show with uh, various examples that uh, during the time of uh, uh, Tarat Chandra Dash or uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, Iravati Karve or during those times, there were majority of the anthropologists at that time was doing the so-called colonial kind of studies. That, that didn't uh, endanger anthropology. Uh, what oh, there are so many things that have to yes, do. Yes, yes, yes. I, I must publish it. Uh, so, yes, there are a lot of scientists that are so many. Uh, will you be a little louder? I couldn't hear you. But did you actually say you are, you are not feeling that it's unfortunate? In fact, I what I actually why I said unfortunate is because sociology ultimately in India is not separate from anthropology. But the but uh, that kind of thing... I, mean, no, I, I, I would object here. Sociology is a separate subject from anthropology simply because of the fact that sociologists are not... Sociologists cannot do a biocultural study like an anthropologist. This is a very simple answer. Why sociology should be regarded as an anthropology? Because sociology... The sociology cannot study the human beings from a holistic perspective. Sociology studies the society. That's all. One branch of anthropology studies society. That is the social anthropology. But that is one branch. The physical anthropology study the whole whole biological aspects of human beings. Sociologists never study that. They are not equipped. They are not competent enough to study. Anyway, I will now go to the second comment. Amen Srinivas was an anthropologist who set up the Delhi Department of Sociology. Yes, that's true. <coughs> Amen Srinivas was trained in uh, trained in uh, at Oxford, yeah. and he, he was trained as an anthropologist. Amen Srinivas knew to knew how to do field work very well, so he trained his student in the field of tradition. Many of my friends trained by Amen Srinivas are in the Delhi School of Economics Sociology Department, and they are doing a very good anthropological study. They, they have written wonderful ethnographies. Uh, the, 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 there is no harm in it. It enriches our subject as well as sociology. What's the harm in it? And then, then question is, thought, th uh, yes, thank you for uh, You pointed out that anthropologists using the ethnographic method is more suitable for microcosmic studies and often face difficulties in connecting with the local. I, I want to know anthropologists changing role of nation building in light. I know. No, I have already answered this question. Where Vinay Srivastava was moving between sociology, yes, that's true. Vinay was uh, all Vinay was a trained anthropologist. Bartholomew has thanked me and uh, thank you, Bartholomew, again. Uh, anyway, yes, no, no, no more such important questions.
Yes, Gadde, I think uh, we should finish up now. Uh, no, no, sir, I have a question. <clears throat> you have a question, yes, very good. Um, nation building is a, such an important uh, uh, topic. Um, uh, this is uh, the urgency where anthropology has to take up. And thank you for initiating the leader, uh, this uh, role, taking the leadership and bringing to the, the important topic to the front. And, uh, and, and also you are uh, uh, raising awareness levels how anthropologists uh, has contributed to the nation building in the past. And uh, particularly ours is a nation, uh, multilinguistic, multireligious, and uh, huge uh, diversity. So in the, um, the major issue of um, the nation building in India is the diversity management and uh, religious pluralism. And uh, how do you see, how do you see uh, anthropological contributions and uh, 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 that can make difference in these areas? Yes, uh, you see, we can still learn from history. You look at, uh, I emphasized on three important things. The, what were the challenges before the new nation? The first challenge was resettlement of the refugees. Have the refugee problem has gone away from India till today? No. We still find refugee influx, officially or in, unofficial. And refugee influx still remains a problem. Have the refugees been properly resettled in some parts? they may have started a new life. But in various parts, they are facing a lot of problem with the host population and they are also causing a lot of problem to the host population. So this kind of dynamics will always be there in India because in, of India's uh, largeness and uh, uh, porous borders and etc. You still have these uh, refugees at right uh, at our capital. In the national capital region, you have problems around these, uh, these Bhutanese refugees and all kinds of refugees from uh, the borders coming into there. Now, the second thing is that that uh, we 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 have to proceed towards development, and in order to do our development, we have to undertake some projects. We have to build, build industries, not that uh, industries should not be built. Whether we should build industries on fertile agricultural land or not is a kind of policy issue. This is where anthropologists can contribute. You know, the recent events uh, in a recent past, the events in Shingur and Nandigram, how they have shocked, the, the shocked and starred the whole country. Uh, uh, and uh, what, even a government was changed uh, at West Bengal State uh, solely around these uh, issues of uh, development cause displacement. So this development cause displacement will always be there in India uh, as long as we want to proceed as a nation. So dam building and these uh, 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 in, uh, building of highways, multi-lane highways, etc., all these things should go on, but in which direction they are going and which direction they should follow, what are the impacts of these big development projects on the local populations will always remain a problem uh, for the nation. And the anthropologists should invest more time using their classical methods to study these problems and suggest to the planners uh, what should be done. It is not that anthropologists will not be considered. If we can make real studies, if we can make studies which can really enlighten or illuminate our policy makers, then definitely I, I, am, a, I am very optimistic on this ground. I, I don't think that any kind of government in India, uh, whether rightist, leftist or centrist, they can ignore anthropology. Why? not because of the fact that we search for biological and cultural diversities, but because of the fact that development process uh, should operate and development process also has diverse impact over this di diverse nation, over this plural nation. So development in our country also has to be taken up 
in a pluralistic fashion. The way industries should be built in Kerala and the way industries should be built in Bengal or way industries should be built in Rajasthan cannot be same. So this is where we can really contribute. To, we can study the local situation, we can study the local population, we can go to them directly, which planners often do not have time to do these things uh, during, uh, say, for example, a political scientist. Nowadays, political scientists, economists are also taking up, adopting the anthropological methods. Why? Why? Because our methods are very unique and our methods are very useful. We can use our methods to channel our uh, direction, uh, not only uh, in uh, solving problems of our country, but also to suggest to the policy makers that why they should consider anthropological recommendations in all good earnest. That's, that's my uh, uh, a big question uh, which lies behind the anthropologist is that, uh, that will not there be any theory building by the anthropologist? Sometimes we search for theories and theories about these things. My simple answer is that your theories will emerge from the ground. Theories or ideas do not fall from the sky. Mm -hmm. They emerge from the ground. So if we, do, if we can go on doing, solving the problems of our nation, theories will emerge out of that. And that, that theory will not be a, a theory which follows the British tradition, French tradition, or American tradition, etc. Et this is my, my vision of looking at uh, anthropology in the future. As Vinay Srivastava, my friend, was always saying that look at the future of anthropology. The future of anthropology lies there. Uh, we have to learn our lesson from the past in order to move in the future. This is my idea. The thing is, uh, anthropology has recently uh, finished its journey of 100 years uh, of its existence in the Indian subcontinent. And uh, we have lots of contribution. Uh, to the anthropology literature. Um, the thing is, um, one of the major issue in Indian society is uh, uh, inequal social inequality justified or sustained by caste system, which is a social problem, major social issue uh, from this part of the world. So in the process of nation building, uh, how these anthropo existing uh, anthropological uh, studies can contribute or is there any special study that uh, specially addresses to promote a social uh, inclusivity and uh, equality and harmony, and how anthropological insights and understandings can really enhance in that front to uh, facilitate a process of national building, particularly they are taking insights from anthropological studies of caste system in India. Uh, it, which system? Which system? Caste system. Caste system, yes. You see, uh, caste is a very dynamic entity. Now, anthropological studies of caste system have already been done. Notable studies have already been done. Uh, one study I would uh, just, just which comes to my mind, and it's well known to many anthropologists in, in India, is the study done by F.G. Bailey, who was a very famous and notable author on caste in India and his caste and the economic frontier. He particularly based himself in Orisha, but he had studied the problems of caste, caste dynamics in a modern nation. Now, studying caste dynamics is a, in a modern nation is a very, very interesting area. Another person is definitely, another person is definitely Adre Bete. Adre Bete is an Indian. He again was first trained in anthropology at Calcutta University and later he shifted to sociology. But Adri Bete has made very important contribution uh, on the caste system in India. Again, uh, the diversities of caste system uh, across the country again has to be studied by I, I, I won't say that we have done uh, the studies, uh, all the studies on the dynamics and that. and caste is what what uh, what actually intrigues me is that that how under the uh, under the 
face of various changes, why caste system still persists? What is the what is the spirit of this system? What is the inner strength of this system? Because caste system definitely a system of social inequality. Then why social inequality has been legitimized in such a beautiful fashion and which can still persist, although we claim that we are democratic, socialist, secular republic, but caste system still persists. Caste system persists in our educational institutions, in our neighborhood, in our locality, in the different spheres of public life, how it persists. <coughs> I think anthropologists do not have the full answer to this question. Do we have enough data on how caste system really persists in the government offices? What is the role of state in promoting the system of caste? I think the, uh, even the question of reservation should be relooked into this. So how the new groups of uh, privilege uh, we call classes, sometimes it's a combination of castes. What we uh, look at a class is actually a combination of caste groups. How these different caste groups are being formed. Excellent studies uh, on these have been done already, but these studies again are localized. These were done, as I have said, in case of Bailey, it was located in Orissa. In case of Adrian Meyer, it, it was located in uh, in the southern, uh, in the uh, central India. In case of Adrebete, it was located in uh, southern India. Uh, Amen Sriwar studied it in uh, long ago in some North Indian village. There is few fewer studies on Bengal caste system, but still there are studies on caste system in Bengal. But I think we still do not uh, know much about how this peculiar animal named caste uh, adapts in a variety of environmental and ecological situations. That has to be studied. Koilash Malhotra and Madhav Gadgil studied caste system in Western India, and there they had shown that how caste systems uh, are ecologically uh, sustainable through diverse kinds of occupations, etc. In a in a very remote part of uh, the Western Ghat Hills, so we find a variety of things on uh, caste. These many things are the problem is that anthropologists. Uh, are not united. They are not united. They are not united under an umbrella to take up studies which can really help us to build up our nation. That is the main problem. We have not identified our problem yet. We have to identify our problem. We have to get ourselves united. And here comes the importance of Indian anthropology at the global level. I think a number of uh, non-Indian anthropologists can also contribute in the problem of foundation building. We have to join hands with them to look for their, because I'm not talking of Western countries. I, 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 we, can, uh, we can see what anthropologists at Nigeria are doing, what anthropologists at Namibia are doing, what anthropologists at Botswana are doing, what anthropologists at Liberia are doing. So there are lots of African and other Asian countries. Recently, I visited Vietnam and I had found that uh, uh, it's a very strong and wonderful country. And later I searched that there are good anthropology departments at Vietnam uh, and they are doing good studies. So we have to uh, join our hands with our Asian and uh, African neighbors uh, to look at their own problems of nation building because you know Vietnam was under Vietnam was a colony under the French. Then after uh, liberating from the French, the American aggression came, and then Vietnam after the American aggression ended with their heroic fight. Uh, how they are slowly building up their own nation and 
what role the Vietnamese anthropologists are playing uh, in building up their nation. This, these things have to be studied. Our problem is that we have studied more on the, we, have, we know more about British anthropology, we know more about French anthropology, we know more about American anthropology, but we, how much do we know about anthropology in Cambodia or anthropologists at Vietnam? There are very good and strong anthropology departments in those countries, in Thailand, uh, in Nigeria, in Botswana. In many places, there are good anthropology departments uh, in Asian and African countries. One of the tasks of your, this association for anthropologists of hum for humankind uh, anthropology studies the humankind, but if you look at anthropologists themselves, they are very much divided. They, they do not behave as a humankind. Uh, US That's anthropology, uh, British anthropology, Indian anthropology, uh, Polish anthropology, etc. We have all kinds of an, uh, national anthropologists operating at local levels. But do we really have a global anthropology? So in the next uh, World Anthropology Day, I hope that we should celebrate global anthropology, which is, which, which is different. That's a good suggestion yeah. to take up. Um, I, I, I am I'm shocked that uh, we don't have answers. Anthropologists who study in India, being from India and study in India, yeah. uh, we don't have answers to solve the caste issue. That is a shocking and uh, very a sad uh, observation. But it, uh, but we, we have to agree the fact. If, uh, but uh, we can, I agree with you, sir, that um, we can learn from different kind, um, schools of thought uh, from different uh, school, anthropology from different countries, how the local anthropologists in those countries are really addressing the issue of social inequality and what are the lessons that we can learn from them to address the social inequality, social inequality in India, which is sustained by a caste system so that uh, we, we can come up, we use those frameworks uh, to mm -hmm. address this inequality. Uh, but uh, the, the caste system is a pan-Indian experience and uh, thousands of years of its presence and with all, using uh, the universal human rights and um, uh, rights-based approach uh, to development and uh, social mobilizations and capacity development and uh, many other aspects why we still struggle where i also uh, agree with you that we don't see it as a problem that is we have to first of all identify the list of problems of nation building in, in india so that's what you are saying uh, you already listed some issues which are uh, pertinent uh, but this is a pan indian experience uh, irrespective of the culture caste and the, these regions um, the caste is uh, sweeping uh, so this is a major issue and even the constitution bans the untouchability but uh, the fruits of untouchability is maintained by the system so instead of addressing the fruits uh, we have to address the roots of the evil system uh, which is a social inequality and uh, the uh, uh, related uh, consequences of indian experience so uh, Anthropological Association for U Humankind in its first national congress, Professor Arjun Apodurai has uh, given given us the task of addressing this caste issue in India. So, and uh, we are really seriously thinking about it. And uh, Professor um, Abhijit Gurra, sir, please help us. And uh, unlike-minded people, uh, from particularly who are trained in anthropology throughout the country, should come together. And also people who studied in India about this issue uh, also can be networked and uh, a serious uh, dialogue and uh, reflection and policy suggestions. Uh, uh, it's good that uh, you are optimistic about the government. Governments uh, are welcoming uh, anthropologists to have uh, the con contribution on the policy aspects in addressing the issues of nation building. That optimism uh, is really light for us because uh, we uh, anthropologists 
when compared to other disciplines of social sciences uh, on Indian university campuses are minority. But um, our contribution to national building is significant. Um, if we weave together um, uh, the scattered experiences who, which, who, paid, who played a vital role mm -hmm. in contributing to a positive impact on policy and uh, implementation and evaluation aspects. So another important question is um, uh, tribal integration and um, the national building, uh, how anthropologists can play the role. Uh, that is another important question, sir. Uh, I want to, because time is not there much. Uh, I will only say, I will point out your first part of your uh, commentary. Uh, you please look at Dr. B. R. Ambedkar's works and contribution on uh, caste issues. And uh, I have uh, specifically dealt with Dr. Ambedkar's contribution in this book on nation building and what role Reed did really, how we can look at Ambedkar, particularly in view of the uh, fact that nation building in a country like India. Uh, reading of Ambedkar's text uh, is, was a very uh, interesting experience for me. And I was searching for Ambedkar's and anthropological contributions. And I found a very interesting article written by Ambedkar in 1916. Uh, the title of the article is Cast in India. I would suggest you to read the article or reread the article. This article was presented in a seminar at Columbia University, USA, where Ambedkar was a student at that time. And uh, Ambedkar was, Ambedkar's teacher was Franz Boas. <clears throat> and how Ambedkar was influenced by Boasian ideas uh, has recently been uh, elaborated through a very brilliant historical research by uh, Jesus Shires Garza, uh, an anthropologist from Manchester University. And if you read that Garza's account, uh, I have also written one which is published in a journal published from India. It's a safe journal. Its name is Contemporary Voice of the Dalit. So in that article, in that journal, I have published this article. So if, if you look at Ambedkar's idea of nation building, Ambedkar's ideas of how to eradicate caste inequality. One point Ambedkar emphasized again and again was that, that uh, contrary to popular notion, castes really survive on marriage. So caste system survives on the closure of marriage unions between the castes. So Ambedkar's, one of Ambedkar's conviction was that as more and more modern avenues of education, public spheres and all these kinds of things, Ambedkar solely emphasized on education because he thought that the, it is the educational spheres which will break the barriers of marriage between castes. And Ambedkar believed that if inter-caste marriages occur, more frequently, gradually the notion of caste has to be weakened. That was one of Ambedkar's notions. Because he says that the ancient moorings of castes are no more present, but caste still persists. How and why? So his suggestion was that break the uh, marriage barrier first. So that will destabilize the caste system. And Ambedkar did not uh, 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 want a very revolutionary change that through some bloody revolution, castes will go away. No, he didn't believe in that. He believed in a slow process of weakening the caste system. And uh, I do not know how far this has taken place, but I think anthropologists should also collect data, a lot of data, empirical data, on inter-caste marriages, collect case studies on inter-caste marriages, collect how inter-caste caste marriages really take place, what was the reception of the society, 
how the society looked at it. So my suggestion should be to st study more and more the cases of intercaste marriages. There you will find the germs of uh, weakening the caste system. This much I can say right now. <coughs> Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, that's a, a very valuable suggestion. Oh, excellent. So, dear friends, uh, we are going to close this uh, um, uh, lecture series. Uh, uh, lecture. So, uh, before we close this session, uh, is there any other question? Because it's already late. And uh, if there are questions, if there are questions again, because questions do not end. You know, questions can go on for the whole night. Yes. So, uh, if anyone has any question, just shoot an email to me. I have. Yeah. An email. I will. I will answer the questions because uh, I think you should not allow any more questions now, or even by anything by me. Uh, my sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sure. So, um, uh, I will um, post. Uh, uh, if you have, if you want to ask questions uh, on this topic, uh, yeah, uh, Professor Abhijit Gohasar's email will be available to you, and you can contact me, and I will uh, uh, send you the email IDs of both the speakers. I thank you, uh, Professor uh, Bartholomew Crispin Dean, sir, uh, for your valuable time and insights and the pioneering work in political anthropology, and uh, the, your theoretical contribution for. Um, for future generations to facilitate, uh, uh, to study um, uh, the memory and the trauma and uh, narrative and uh, what anthropologists can provide for understanding the human crisis and uh, the responses. And also, thank you, Professor uh, Abhijit Gohasar, for your valuable, uh, the most important and needed uh, topic, uh, particularly uh, from the Indian context. Um, anthropology, um, national building in Indian anthropology, uh, providing lead uh, for future anthropologists and uh, pointing to the areas where we need to focus our studies. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all the participants. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gade, for organizing this wonderful event. Much appreciate all of your efforts. Yeah, we are we are we are going to continue this the distinguished lecture series and um, uh, the all through the year and uh, particularly important uh, topics of nation building. Uh, so we we are looking forward for the speakers uh, who are experts in uh, issue based research um, uh, uh, with the, anthro the ethnographic accounts so that uh, they can provide uh, rich insights and. Uh, uh, to press forward in this uh, important uh, theme of uh, uh, anthropological contributions for uh, promoting the human welfare and uh, hum improving the human condition and well-being. So this theme will continue all through this year uh, till the next uh, the World uh, Anthropology Day. So we will be looking forward for the uh, listening to the world-renowned anthropologists how they are addressing these issues of uh, uh, humans, uh, contemporary issues of uh, how humans are facing and suffering, and how anthropology is making difference to improve uh, the human condition. Uh, thank you, thank sir. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, sir.